chance to start talking about uh, the beginning of part two, the second part of today. So um, I forgot to remind you that you should uh, have started reading part two already. Um, on Friday, um, we'll continue part two, and you should be reading, uh, let's say, through page 51. 4.42 Friday, and then for next Monday, you should finish part of it. You should be done with the second section. Um, and while I'm mentioning it, uh, it's getting to be time to start thinking about papers. Um, so probably not today, but over the weekend, you should uh, start to think about some secondary literature and some possible I think we'll do two weeks from Monday. So that's November. Okay. We were asking when is a maximum a good time? I want to try to think about the big picture here just for uh, a couple minutes and then we'll be able to finish out. So when is a maximum a good one? The answer to that question, given by teleological theories, is that the good maxims, the ones that we should adopt, are the ones that aim at ends that contain the most good. That's what a teleological theory says. That what we should do is act so as to promote the most good, where what the good is, is something that's independently identified. And so a teleological theory starts by identifying what states of affairs are good, and then tells us what we should do is act to maximize that. So a teleological theory is going to answer that question, when is a maximum good, by pointing to, maybe we could say it's material content, what it is that it's aiming. But for Kant, that's clear, yes? Questions about that? Yeah. But for Kant, um, there is no such independently identifiable good, no independently identifiable state of affairs that the good maxims of all in that. Because there's no way to identify what is objectively good until we know which wills are good. Having a good will is the condition for some state of affairs, some object being good. And so we don't know which wills are good until we know which maxims are good. So we can't identify the good maxims by asking whether they are material. Whether they're aiming at the independently identifiable good states of affairs. Um, okay, so the teleological answer is not available to come. All we know for Khan is that the good maxims are maxims which could be the basis for objective value. So we know that when somebody wills properly, that satisfies the condition for the end being objectively valid. So the good maxims are the ones that, the ones for which it's at least possible for someone to act on them and by doing so um, create objective value. So all we can say so far for Kant is that the maxim could possibly be the basis for creating objective value. Because that's just what it means to say that a good will is the condition for an end to be good. Is that clear? Oh, not so much. OK, so in rejecting the teleological view, right at the beginning of part one, Kant is saying that objects, states of affairs of the world, 
can be conditionally good. What's the condition that makes them good? They're willed by a good will. A good will is one that acts on the right maxims. So the right maxim had better be one that at least potentially could create, could be the condition that creates objective values, that, that when satisfied makes the state of affairs that's willed actually be good. Clear? Yeah. If a good will is the end. A good will, a good will is not the end, a good will is the condition that so makes the end that it wills good. Under any condition, if the end were to be a good will, then wouldn't that be objective to be good? Good will is the condition of the end. Um, so a good will isn't exactly an end in the sense of a state of affairs of the world. It certainly is not a state of affairs of the empirical world. So you're right. There's a sense in which a goodwill, in a certain sense, you might say, is a kind of necessary end, is in fact objectively good. But I want to carefully distinguish a goodwill from an end that is to be achieved, an end that is will. Uh, it, and, 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 and it's not an object to be achieved. It's not a state of affairs of the world. So, yes and no. So, what I'm talking about here are the objects of the will, what it is that a good will wills. Okay, so the good maxims are the maxims that could be such that, the good maxims are the ones that are such that, if a will acts on the basis of them, then the condition for that object to be good is satisfied. Is that clear? Let me say that again. So a good will, so, so all we know about what makes a maxim a good one is that if a, what makes a maxim a good one, the right one, is that if a will acts on the basis of it, since it's a good one, the condition for the object, the end of the will, being objectively good is satisfied. Because I just said it's supposed to be a good maxim. It's supposed to be a good will. Okay. And that means, Kant thinks, that that maxim could be universalized. Because that maxim, we know, satisfies the condition to make its object objectively good. Objectively good. That means, like, not just good for me, but really good. Good for everyone. what we know about a good maxim. And when it's acted on, the condition for its object, its end, to be objectively good is satisfied. And that just means that everyone could act on that maxim. That maxim could be universalized. Uh, everyone could act on it. Because that's the maxim which is supposed to make its object objectively good. Okay. Uh, and for Kant, that's it. That's the only requirement. That's the only condition on a maxim being um, permissible, being uh, a good one. And I, said, I think I said this last time, anything more than this, anything additional beyond universalizability, Kant says, would be like a material condition on maxims. That is, any, any further requirement would mean that the maxims, the good maxims, all share a property of being aimed at a certain material end, which is good. But there is no such prior. Those ends are made good by being willed on the proper maxim. So anything more, any additional 
uh, requirements on that beyond universalizability would mean that there's some further object or state of affairs that's good in itself, and there's not. And anything less than this requirement, universalizability, um, would mean that uh, would mean that a good will would not be the condition that makes states of affairs good. In effect, if this, in effect, if this universalizability requirement were not in place, then a goodwill would not be making ends objectively valuable. And the implication for Kant would be that nothing would then be objectively valuable. And we'd never have any reason to do anything. So, this, so denying universalizability as a condition for good maxims is, amounts to a kind of radical skepticism. Amounts to saying that nothing is objectively good and we don't ever have a reason, an objective reason, a good reason to do anything. Okay, questions about that so far? So, um, so our grand conclusion, of course, is Kantian uh, ethics is deontological. That is, it's not too logical. We did that. It doesn't start from identifying what is independently good and then having us direct our actions toward that thing. Instead, it looks to the requirements for good willing as itself defining what the good ends are. And the requirements on good willing are simply acting on maxims that could be universalized. OK, so I want to say this a slightly different way. Uh, any maxim that could possibly, so, sorry, so what's a maxim again? Talking a lot about maxims. What are maxims? Not just a reason. So the reason I've called the incentive, and that is part of a maxim, but that's not all. Right, so a maxim is a, is a subjective principle of action, right? Uh, and included in the maxim is both the action, the thing that you're doing, and the incentive, the reason why. Um, and I've spent a lot of time trying to explain that neither the action or the purpose or the object itself nor the incentive or the reason itself is enough to determine whether a maxim is good. It's the combination of the two. Now, the point here is that any maxim that could possibly be universalized, any maxim that could possibly be the basis for making an end objectively valuable, because universalizability is a necessary requirement for any maxim to be able to make its end objectively valuable. Say that one more time. In order for an axiom to be able to make its end objectively valuable, it has to be the case that everybody could act on it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be objectively valuable. So, a necessary requirement for a maxim um, to be able to make its end objectively valuable. Um, is that it's universalizable. So only, the other way around, only universalizable maxims could possibly make their ends objectively valid. 